Welcome back. This is episode 230 of the Veterinary Business video show. In this episode, we'll hear some thoughts about whether or not corporate, corporatization was a good idea, and we'll learn how to deliver some outrageous acts of customer service. We'll question the significance of your telephone personality. We'll le learn something about a reimagined veterinary conference. And I'll offer you my quick business tip for this episode. I'm John Sheridan, and this is the video show from Veterinary Business. Back in 1996, I was one of the founders of Veterinary Practice Initiatives, the first of the corporate investors in veterinary practice in the UK. Our company failed seven years later for a number of reasons, but corporate investment in practice has grown like crazy ever since. We're now seeing some consolidation of the consolidators. This summer, it was reported that the Mars organization had purchased the Linnaeus Group, which had been operating 82 practices in the UK. As you might expect, my own view is that corporate investment in our profession has been very good news overall, but like any disruptive business initiative, it has created a number of major challenges for the owners and managers of what we might describe as the independent veterinary practice sector. Here's a clip with some extracts from an episode of Dave Nichols' freewheeling website in which he responds to a question from James Westgate, editor of the Veterinary Business Journal. Answering the question, I'm not dodging it James, is it a good thing? Um, it will be good for some, okay, and this is the absolute truth, it's going to be great for some. Some people will enjoy working in a more structured, a theoretically more supported environment, and Mars Corps have got a lot of experience of running veterinary hospitals. Um, those things should be in the, the plus column. In the negative column, it's a big corporate run for shareholders, and corporations exist for the sole benefit of their shareholders. Legally, that is the case, and that's like every American uh, organization that is legally their primary organization is to their shareholders not to their teams, not to their customers. Now, clearly, it makes no sense to uh, not look after your teams and not look after your customers, but nobody should be in any doubt. This is not woolly, fluffy James Herriot uh, that is coming to save the veterinary profession. This is corporatization coming to make the maximum dollar it can from the minimum amount of resources, because that's what businesses do. Um, and does that have an impact on healthcare? Um, well, it remains to be seen, but... I think if you were to take a trip across and look at any Banfield or VCA hospital, you would find them to be uh, really well-built, really well-specced out um, uh, businesses um, with some very innovative marketing programs. So, um, you know, I think in theory it should be a good thing. In practice, the challenge for every corporate is the same. How do you maintain an engaged workforce? And that's, that's nothing to do with veterinary medicine. But how do you maintain an engaged workforce when that workforce consists of highly uh, smart, very independently strong-willed veterinarians? That is an entirely different challenge. And I think that is where a lot of the friction has come from corporatization, that, that very few people, individuals, have found the best way to manage teams effectively in the clinical environment, and very few corporates, uh, in fact, even fewer, and I would say, uh, almost none, as far as I can see, have absolutely nailed that to the point where their team engagement, their staff uh, retention, um, team happiness is better than it would be in a well-run small independent practice. practice. So, um, I think it's horses for courses. If you like small, if you like um, strong team, local-based team culture and, and client relations and all very personal, then independence probably going to be the way to go. Um, if you like to have job flexibility and better benefits, and um, and you don't mind the fact that there's probably going to be a slightly less personal way of doing business, and you can handle that, uh, and you're up for the perks because I'm sure these guys with deep pockets are going to fight hard for your attention as a vet. Um, then maybe corporate's going to be for you. But I answered this question when I was up at the Royal Vet College speaking to students yesterday and I said no vet should choose their job based on money they should do it based on fit and that means understanding what you need as an individual uh, is it support 
Is it good people around you? Um, you know, there's a whole bunch of different things that people want uh, from their job. And I think that's why when it comes down to the individual vet, it actually doesn't matter if it's corporate or independent. What matters is you understand what you need as a clinician and you make sure that you uh, match up and you're interviewing the people you go work for to make sure that they can deliver on that. Uh, and if you get that match right, then it probably doesn't matter which particular legal entity or size organization you work for. In the end, the truth is it's all going to come down to the people you're working with and the people you're working for. Um, if, they're, if you have a good leader in any team, in any structure, you probably have a good team environment. And if you have a leader who sucks, it doesn't matter how much you're getting paid. It's just not a fun place to work. Now let's see who's on the video show Soapbox. The vet on the soapbox today is Joel Parker of Veterinary Practice Solutions. In this clip, Joel will offer some thoughts about some unexpected acts that you or your colleagues in practice could do to receive a standing ovation from your clients. This week we're talking about something that I really love, and this is outrageous acts of customer service. Like how outrageous can you get? I guess suppose there's a point where you could be doing something so outrageous that people wouldn't like it. But I'm talking about those unusual, unexpected acts that a practice can do that when people come into your practice, they experience an experience that was really unsuspected. It's almost like a performance of your favorite band that is so off the wall with new music and the performance that you stand up and you give a standing ovation. Behind Every standing, excuse me, behind every standing ovation is some degree of unexpectancy and a delivery of a service, a delivery of an experience that it was above and beyond what was expected. So how do we find out what those are? Let's go over some action steps here, okay? Number one, find out what's out there. And this is where you do a Google search. And you go out there and you can just type in, you know, outrageous acts of customer service. And what you're going to find on there are companies like Nordstrom's and so forth that show up. And Nordstrom's, the U.S. clothier, is famous for its outrageous acts of customer service. Right down to an 80-year-old gentleman that returned a set of snow tires. They gave him the return and they walked him through to pick out some new shirts and so forth. And Nordstrom's doesn't even sell snow tires. So things like that. This would be where a client's returning a bag of dog food, for example, in your practice and you don't even carry that brand but you return it and you give them something else. This would be having all your patients arrive for the wellness exams with uh, an empty stomach. So number one, you can pull some blood, you can do some procedures if you can, and then thirdly, if you're really, you know, uh, if you've got some really good treats, you can feed the patient, you can feed the dog, things like that. Other ones would be, you know, good follow-up calls. I think a key one is also having, you know, short little videos, two to three minute videos of why your veterinarians became veterinarians so that when a new client books an appointment with you, you text them uh, a little YouTube video, a little two, three, four minute video of why the veterinarians become a veterinarian so that the new client can really see the driving force behind the practice. Also think about this. What would happen if you're hiring a new graduate? They're going to graduate, let's say, in a couple months. You get them to shoot a video as to why they became a veterinarian and you start you know, showing that to all your clients. You put that on your Facebook site, your Instagram site. You start pushing it out in your text messaging and so forth. So there's lots of things you can do uh, to improve the experience. So find out what's out there, Google it, create a list, and then start implementing and have some fun doing this. I think that's the thing. This is a creative thing that gets done on a daily basis with your staff. You've got to have staff that love doing outrageous things and clients will begin to really appreciate that. So guys, you get started to do that, you start hiring the right staff that can start to do these wonderful outrageous acts of customer service, which could be simple things like you're already doing, like dropping dog food off for a client. I even think doing home euthanasias, you know, that sad, sad time is an act of customer service that really, really helps them. So put on your thinking caps, have a staff meeting, get yourself a whiteboard, and get your staff involved in this, get their creativity behind it. I think that's super important. If you're going to get buy-in from your staff, they've got to be part of the creative process, and then get them coming up with great examples of outrageous customer service. And again, guys, do your research on the web. There's some amazing things that are done out there. I've mentioned just a couple. Now for a tip from the top in the business world of veterinary practice. Today's tip from the top is from Wendy Myers of Communications Solutions for Vets. Wendy reminds us that telephone callers to your practice will form a lasting impression of your business within just seven seconds. They can't see your premises or the person who answers the phone, and Wendy suggests that it's the tone of voice 
rather than exactly what you say, that will color that impression. Did you know callers form an impression of your veterinary hospital within seven seconds? When you answer the phone, callers cannot see you, so your tone of voice sways their decisions. If monotone Mary answers, the flat voice tells the pet owner, I'm bored and I have no interest in helping you or your pet. Racing Rachel answers the phone with a greeting so fast you can barely understand her. Her speed tells the client, I'm in a hurry and don't have time to help you. Your tone of voice communicates your attitude. Callers will hear loud and clear whether you're golden retriever friendly or snarling. To project a warm personality, smile when you talk on the phone. The reason is physiological rather than psychological. Smiling causes a soft palate in the back of your mouth to raise and this gives sound waves a nice fluid sound. Callers will hear a warm and friendly voice. Improve your inflection, which are the highs and lows in the pitch of your voice. This movement or melody to your voice tells callers that you're interested in what they're saying and truly engaged in the conversation. Your voice slides up when you ask a question such as, where did you adopt your new puppy? And then dips down when you complete a thought or share instructions. A lower pitched voice has more authority, such as, let me tell you what to expect for a 12 week old puppy exam. Have the personality of confident Catherine, sounding knowledgeable, friendly, and eager to help. Your voice is your signature, so share your best personality. Now for my quick business tip for this episode. The trigger for my business tip for this episode was a video on YouTube promoting the American Animal Hospital Association Conference. The meeting was held last month in Denver, so it's too late for this year, but I thought you might like to see the clip in any event because the meeting has been described as a reimagined conference and renamed as Connexity. So what's my quick business tip? Well, it's this. If you watch the video and you may be looking for something new for your CPD next year, take a look at the AHA website. The next Connexity conference will be held in Indianapolis in September 2019. So maybe well worth a trip. Well, that's about it for now. I'm John Sheridan and this has been another video show from Vetney Business. See you next time.